our speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Lisa Trevor from the Department of History of Art here at Berkeley. She joined us here after completing her PhD at Harvard in 2013. She is an expert on art, architecture, and ritual among the Fiji. So, much uh, Lisa for your kind words and everyone for for coming today really it's a, a great honor and privilege for me to be here today you know at this uh, sacred place for researchers <laughs> from all over the world now, this is my my first time here I'm I feel really honored first of all I would like to express my uh, deepest gratitude to the University of California and especially to, to professors Lori Welke, Lisa Trevor and Rosemary Joyce for their kind invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share with all of you their 
<coughs> our most recent archaeological discoveries in, in Mexico City. As well, I, I would like to thank the Association for Latin American Art for actively supporting this uh, very short stay in California and my lecture for tomorrow at the Dijon Museum of uh, San Francisco. I bring I, I, I brought everything but my my reading glasses. Sorry about that. <laughs> Important thing. The archaeology of Tenochtitlan is unlike that of any other city in the field of Mesoamerican studies. Constrained by circumstances, it faces the same types of challenges posed by the archaeology of Rome, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and any settlement in the ancient world whose vestiges lie beneath a modern metropolis. To study the capital of the Aztec Empire, archaeologists must overcome the enormous bar barrier represented by Mexico City, an obstacle that happens to be the second largest demographic concentration on the continent at the dawn of the 21st century. Based on even the most conservative estimates, the Latin American megalopolis, not Wow. <laughs> That's magic. Thank you very much. Based on even the most conservative estimates, the Latin American megalopolis uh, has close to 20 million inhabitants. As a result, not only Tenochtitlan, but also almost of all of the neighboring cities that once dotted the lakeshore are buried beneath tons of asphalt and concrete. However, the fundamental problem is not the unbridled growth of the city today, but rather the particular features of its historic center. This area, which was declared by a World Heritage Site by UNESCO, shelters the monumental complex with the greatest artistic and historic wealth on the Americas. There are historic buildings of outstanding quality in a surprising diversity of styles, including Baroque, Neoclassical, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Neocolonial, and Eclectic, <laughs> stand side by side atop the ancient Aztec city. In such a context, the paradox is that any ambitious attempt to recover the material remains of Tenochtitlan and to reconstruct the history of its inhabitants implies sacrificing a fundamental part of the city's colonial heritage and that of the 19th and 20th centuries, thus denying the multicultural condition of today's Mexico. A proven way of saving structures that are obstacle for archaeologists is by means of under, underground explorations. However, work of this type is almost inconceivable in downtown Mexico City for two simple reasons. On the one hand, the subsoil of the ancient lake basin, basin is extremely instable due to the fact it is composed of compressible clays. On the other hand, the subsoil is difficult to penetrate given the high water table and thick layers of asphalt and concrete crisscrossed by chaotic networks for drinking water, drainage, and electricity. Furthermore, immediately under this layer are the oldest levels of the capital of New Spain, which date to the period between 1521 and 1650. These layers are distinguished by an uncommon abundance of cultural elements that attest to the opulent lifestyle of the conquerors and their descendants. Walls and foundations of sumptuous palaces, tons of fragments of Chinese porcelain and Spanish and Italian majolica, as well as exorbitant quantities of botijas, pottery jars used to transport wine, vinegar, oil, olives, and capers from far away Andalusia. These heavy consumption habits are understandable in a urban center that became the most bustling Spanish center overseas. Beneath the, the colonial layers lie the ruins of a Tenochtitlan ravaged by a, the, the violent confrontations of 1521 and by the systematic raising of its buildings after the conquest. Logically, the opportunity to reach these levels have been few and far between. Repaving 
hydraulic works, the installation of electrical plants, and remaking foundations of buildings are among the rare occasions that archaeologists must take advantage of to bring minuscule fractions of the Aztec capital to light. This series of obstacles has meant that knowledge of Aztec civilization has progressed at the speed of an eyedropper when compared with what happens, for example, in the Maya area. Suffice it to say that after a century of archaeological work in the center of Mexico City, 0.3% of the five square miles that Tenochtitlan once covered during its maximum splendor has been excavated. In other words, we have only a few pieces of a gigantic puzzle that we know we will never be able to assemble completely. The history of archaeology in down, of downtown Mexico City spans more than, more than two centuries. This intellectual adventure began, began at the end of the 18th century, in the last years of the colonial domination, when ideas from the Enlightenment reached New Spain innovative scientific humanistic ways of thought swiftly spread among the Creoles, fueling the spirit of independence and bringing about a new vision of the pre-Hispanic past. The two most famous monoliths of Aztec art were discovered in this context. The date, 1790. The place, the great plaza or Zócalo. The circumstances work to level and lay cobblestones ordered by Visceral Revillagigedo. The first monument, the first monument to come to light was the Cuatlicue, the supreme image of the Mother Earth. Thanks to the Visceral's intervention, this exceptional piece was not destroyed, but rather was moved to the cloister of the university. This was the first step, a step in establishing the National Archaeological Museum. Most, months later, they uncovered the celebrated Zone Stone, a magnificent disk that embodies Aztec conceptions of space and time. They inserted the, this monument into the western tower of the cathedral to be preserved for posterity. Fortunately, the two monoliths did, didn't go unnoticed by scientists in New Spain. Antonio de Leon y Gama, astronomer and expert of ancient, on ancient documents, published meticulous descriptions, interpretations, and engravings of both monuments. With the 19th century, an era of political turbulence began. This included the struggle for independence, interminable wars between federalists and centralists, liberals and conservatives, and several foreign interventions. During these times of great turmoil, numerous monuments accidentally came to light. Unfortunately, almost all of them were looted and sent to foreign collections, although few ended up in the National Museum. A new period began in 1900 with the work of Leopoldo Batres in the area behind the cathedral. This controversial, controversial figure was in charge of the salvage archaeology during the construction of a drainage, drainage system. For three months, he was able to recover the richest body of Aztec offerings were ever seen. His excavation, records uh, printed in a luxurious volume, chronologically listed his discoveries accompanied by studio photos of the pieces. In 1914, in the midst of the, of the Mexican Revolution, Manuel Gamio coordinated the new salvage project as a consequence of the demolition of a colonial building at the intersection of Seminario and Guatemala streets. The main contribution of this project was the unexpected find of the Templo Mayor or Great Temple, an event that overturned numerous hypotheses regarding the precise location of this pyramid. During the works, Gamio used the stratigraphic techniques for the first time in Mexico City. New intensive salvage archaeology explorations took place in the center of the city between 1968 and 69. The construction of lines one and two of the subway system offered an uncommon opportunity to bring more vestiges of ancient Tenochtitlan to light. A 20-foot wide trench and several miles long revealed an amazing number of monumental sculptures, some choose offerings and buildings, including the round temple that can be seen today in the Pino Suarez subway, subway station. 
However, the exploration of greatest importance in the sacred present of Tenochtitlan had to wait until February 1978, when a group of workers of, from the electricity company accidentally came across a spectacular sculpture of the moon goddess known as Coyol Shauki. Given the normal scientific importance of this monolith and the surrounding area, the president of Mexico made a controversial decision, very controversial, to demolish 13 buildings that occupies an area of 2.5 acres in order to completely uncover the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan. Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History organized the long-term program of scientific research that became known as the Great Temple Project for this purpose. During 38 years, eight long field seasons have been carried out. The first three were coordinated by my mentor, Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, and I have been fortunate to oversee the last five. Among the most outstanding discoveries of our project are the vestiges of the Great Temple itself and 14 nearby buildings, a considerable accumulation of sculptures and mural painting, as well as 206 buried offerings. The offerings are deposit deposits of gifts for the gods, and they are generally cosmic models in miniature composed of enormous riches. Among them, we have found tens of thousands of jade, flint, obsidian, ceramic, turquoise, gold, and copper artifacts, which come uh, from all corners of the Aztec Empire. In addition to earlier Teotihuacan and Olmec relics that were uncovered by the Aztecs in the ruins of the, these venerated civilizations. We should, should also mention human bone remains of dignitaries and sacrifice warriors, as well as animals of more than 400 species from diverse habitats, high mountains, temperate forests, tropical rainforests, swamps, and coastal areas. The principal results have been uh, 500 pu publications and the opening in 1987 of the Great Temple Museum, the headquarters of the project, and where eight galleries are devoted to exhibiting the archaeological materials from the excavations. To date, our different teams working in downtown Mexico City have detected more than 30 religious buildings of the sacred precinct. Among them, we can mention, we already mentioned, the great temple at its small surrounding shrines, the Calmecac, or a school for the nobility, was found below the, the building of the modern Spanish cultural center. The Zompantli, or palisade, where the skulls of sacrificial victims were displayed was below a 19th century mansion, a place where a new chocolate museum will be inaugurated soon. The Teotlaxco main ball court was detected in Guatemala Street, just behind the Metropolitan Cathedral. The Hecateopan, or Wayne God's Temple, was buried on the Cathedral Hotel. We will have there a new restaurant and a bar with it, its own pyramid. <laughs> no. So as you can imagine, these recent archaeological discoveries have completed substantially uh, our vision of the sacred precinct and have forced us to modify our model several times. <laughs> Professor Trevor, has invited me here to share with all of you two of the most spectacular finds made in downtown Mexico City during the, during the last years. The first case that I'd like to tell you about dates back to 200, 2003, when I was invited to Paris by the Mankind Museum to prepare a catalog of the rich collections of Aztec art. My work consisted not only of analyzing archaeological objects, but also visiting, visiting archives and libraries in search of ancient documents that explain the itinerary, itinerary of these objects from Mexico to France. As of, often tends to be the case, I came across writings and drawings that had nothing to do with my research, but that were, that were fundamental in understanding the, begin, the origins of my field in Mexico City at the end of the colonial period. Among other things, uh, the documents that I discovered revealed that uh, in the 18th century, an enigmatic sculpture 
was exposed to passerby that intersection of the streets today known as Argentina and Justo Sierra. These documents describe the sculpture of a claw, which was set into the corner of the Luis de Castilla mansion, today occupied by the famous Porrua bookstore. You can see the, here the 18th century engraving of that claw with a solar disk and a serpent. All indications seem to point to a case similar to that of the Museum of Mexico City, which, was, which has a feather serpent head set into the corner of the building as an architectural ornament. We should recall that when these Baroque and neoclassic mansions were built, it was not longer the custom to destroy Aztec monoliths that accidentally surfaced when foundations were dug. On the contrary, these sculptures began to be appreciated for their aesthetic qualities and their historical significance, so they were used as decorative elements or at corners, as lintels in main entrances, and in courtyards. Later, I was able to corroborate that the sculpture, supposedly in the form of a claw, continued to remain in the same spot in 1823, when English traveler William Bullock reported it on a visit he made to Mexico that year. However, it is clear that the, store, the stone remained hidden when many of the city's streets were elevated to a higher level following floods in the 19th century. When I returned to Mexico, as you can Im imagine, I went straight to the Porrua bookstore with some friends to evaluate the viability of excavated the corner of the building. Suddenly, among the stalls of street vendors, we noticed a manhole dug in the 1950s by the phone company Telefonos de Mexico, and we were afraid that the monument might have been destroyed at, at that time. To our surprise, by lifting the manhole cover, we saw that the sculpture was still there. All those, all, all those surrounded by all sorts of urban installations, including a brick wall, optical fibers, and fo phone electrical and traffic signal ca cables. It took 10 months to get all the necessary permits. That's a <laughs> Mexican, Mexican bureaucracy. To break, break through the sidewalk, remove the cables, do some archaeological exploration, and extract the sculpture. The monolith was christened the Porrua uh, bookstore stone. However, it wasn't the representation of a claw at all, but a burial cactus, one of a kind for its enormous dimensions, as, as for the skill with which the botanical features of the land were carved. As you know, this type of cactus is known in Mexico and the United States and modern in low caution. But I, I don't know why it has this, this name. No? This is a, a good example of Italian design. <laughs> <laughs> For the Aztecs, the burial cactus was one of the symbols of arid la lands and therefore of their northern origins. Soon after, they abandoned the mythical land of Aztlan and set, sent out, set out on their long journey to the promised land. A key event took place. Eight individuals called Mimishkuat fell from the sky onto burial ca ca cactus and mesquites. I don't see very well, I'm sorry. The Aztecs immediately obeyed the command of their patron god Huitzilopochtli to sacrifice the Mimishkoa, extracting their hearts of the thorny plants to feed the sun. Then the god told his followers they would not longer be called Aztecs, but rather Mexicas, and he granted them the tools to become conquerors. Based on these mythical accounts, it can be suggested that monoliths found at the Porrua bookstore evokes one of these early sacrificial bases, so it could have served as a sacrificial base in Aztec rituals. This idea is not so far-fetched if we take into account the fact that the recently discovered stone is of the same height as the two sacrificial stones from stage two of the great temple. We turn now to the, most more, uh, to the much more spectacular find that was made on October uh, 2, 2006. 
It took place right in front of the ruins of the Great Temple when a team of our urban archaeology program explored a lot occupied by the building known as the Mayorazgo de Nava Chavez at the intersection of Argentina and Guatemala streets. On that memorable date, a sculpture of gigantic dimension was detected in situ. There, the city government was building the foundations of a new ethnographic museum to display a rich collection of indigenous textiles and clothing. By accident, one of the workers had used his pickaxe in an area beyond the limits marked by the engineer supervising the work. And suddenly, a small part of the enormous sculpture was exposed. Only the eastern side of the monolith was visible. In any event, this part was enough to make a series of preliminary guesses. In the first place, we realized that the monoliths had been sculpted from a block of pinkish andesite. The Aztecs obtained this volcanic stone from several outcrops in the Chiquihuite geological formation, mainly from the deposits in Cerro Tenayo. By the 15th century, this, was, this hill was located virtually on the shores of what, of, of what was uh, once Lake Texcoco, only six miles away from the island of Tenochtitlan. Obviously, the proximity of these sources had to have simplified the task of obtaining and transporting the block of stone from which this monument was carved. Based on historical sources, when the kings of Tenochtitlan decided to sculpt a new monolith for, for the sacred precinct, they forced cities on the lake shore to contribute large numbers of laborers who had to work directly at the quarries. Each group of workmen came with its own ropes, poles, and, sort of, uh, and a sort of sled on which large boulders could be moved. To the sound of singing, chanting, and shouting, they separated the blocks from the quarries and transported them as poured on by dancers, musicians, and buffoons. In the second place, it was clear that it was a rectangular slab. The monolith measured about 11 feet 9 inches from north to south and roughly 1 foot 8, 3 inches in thickness. This meant that it was even larger that, than the sculpture of the moon goddess Kojulchauki and the sun stone. Based on this, its uh, rough dimensions and very the density of the andesite, we figured its weight was around 13 tons. To drag something of that magnitude from the source to the lecture, some, uh, somewhere between 150 to 400 individuals would, would have been necessary. We, we could imagine that once they, ma uh, they managed to haul the stone to the shore, the Aztecs built an enormous balsa raft to float it to the center of their island city. In the third place, we discovered that the upper surface of the monument was covered with a relief that followed a bilateral pattern. On the eastern side, several rectangular elements were visible in the middle of the stone and five round elements on each side, one of which was separated from the remaining four. The next day, we reviewed a good, a good part of the rich sculptural corpus of this civilization in the literature, and we came to the conclusion that the central rectangles were shells decorating the female back insignia known as starry skirt, and then and the that rounded elements were ten nails from two extended claws. This was exciting to, for us because it meant that it represented a nocturnal earth goddess. There were several candidates belonging to this group of deities, generally, generically known as Sisimime. However, the first five of these goddesses were not known in the form of bas-relief sculpture, while there is only one known is Papalot sculpture of this type. On the other hand, the corpus of Tlaltecutli reliefs contained 51 examples. Based on these fi factors, we decided that the probabilities pointed to, to Tlaltecutli as the deity represented on the new monolith. Tlaltecutli literally means Lord of Lady of the Earth, and as many other deities in the Aztec pantheon, it presents a masculine or feminine side in the mythology and iconography. We've seen uh, cosmic cycles Tlaltecutli as, a, as an earth goddess takes on a double role. 
On the one hand, she, was, she, has, she has generative functions, both in the vegetation cycle and in, in the birth of human beings. She is the mother of, of man, whom she feeds with plants sprouting from her reptilian body. On the other, she is an insatiable deity devouring blood and corpses. In fact, not only does she feed on ordinary creatures that dwell on the Earth's surface and that she herself procreated, but she also gulps down the sun each afternoon, regurgitating it at dawn. But let's return again to the excavation. Several weeks went by, and the archaeology team uncovered the monolith we were able to corroborate our iconographic identification. We were correct. It was a unique and very impressive representation of Tlaltecutli. This piece displays a frontal full-length full figure carved in low relief and whose anatomy adheres to strict bilateral symmetry. Her knees are bent and spread outward in a position that has been interpreted and as that of a woman giving birth. It is worth mentioning that this relief is partially covered with red, ochre, white, blue, and black paint, as it happens with all Aztec sculptures. The goddess has oversight extremities. A distinctive feature is the claw in the right foot framing a calendric date showing the sign rabbit. This complex of attributes fits well with, with Aztec sculpture representing the female personified manifestation of Tlaltecutli. Once the identity of the goddess was defined, our next task was to delve into the monument's functions. Why was such an enormous sculpture placed in front of the great temple? In my view, the key is taking into account where we were standing. We were to the west of the pyramid on its central east-west axis at a spot near the place where the building known as the Cuauhtecalco, the Cuauhtecalco was located. In fact, in this celebrated image of the sacred prison of Tenochtitlan, the Cuauhtecalco appears right at the foot of the great temple. According to Dominican friar Diego Duran and Aztec historian Fernando Alvarado Tososomoc, the ashes of several Aztec kings were buried inside the Cuauhtecalco. The latter emphasized that the mortuary bundles of kings were placed on a great pyre at the foot of the great temple. The flames took hours to consume the king's body, and a part of, he, of his luxurious uh, offerings in a bonfire fed with the hearts and blood of slaves who were sacrificed for the occasion. The resulting ashes were collected and placed in urns and buried in the Cuauhtecalco. The Sosomoc stated that in 1481, the cremated bones, the cremated remains of the Aztec king Ashayacatl were deposited in the inn, I, I, I quote, the great hall of the Cuauhtecalco. He also added that five years later, in 1486, the companions of the following king, Tizoc, were sacrificed in the hall of the stone Cuauhtecalco, and the ashes of this king were buried very near the foot of the great temple. And then in 1502, the spoils of King Awisot were buried not in the Cuauhtecalco, but rather, I quote, to the side of it. On the other hand, the Florentine Codex stated that the Aztecs of the neighboring city of Tlatelolco had the same custom of cremating the bodies of their kings in a place also known as Cuauhtecalco. The scene illustrated in this passage shows the body of the last lord on a huge pyre at the foot of the great temple of that city. These descriptions of the royal funerary rituals, together with certain pictographs referring to the burial of corpses, sheds light on the enigmatic views of the Tlaltecutli monolith. In many codices, mortuary bundles can be seen as at the moment they are consumed by an animal like Tlaltecutli, who opens her mouth wide to receive the dead. In other codices, this early deity swallows the dead son in the form of the deity Tlalchitonatiu, in other words, the son that is near the earth. It is widely, widely known that for the Aztecs, the metaphor for a king's reign is the son's daily cycle. 
Therefore, the death of the sovereign was equated to the arrival of darkness resulting from the setting of the sun at dusk or else a solar eclipse. Assuming that our idea that the great monolith is a funerary monument, the next question would be which of the three kings buried inside the Cuauhtecalco is the one related to the sculpture? The calendric dates carved near one of Tlaltecutli's claw points to Aguizotl, the king of Tenochtitlan, who expanded the frontiers to the empire from the Terrascan highlands to the modern day border with Guatemala. The date on Rabbit is the clincher. Aguizotl died in turn Rabbit that corresponded to the Christian year of 1502. Once the salvage archaeology phase was concluded, the importance of the discovery forced us to halt the construction of the Ethnographic Museum. In March of 2007, a small international team was organized. It was composed by archaeologists, conservators, biologists, geologists, and architects to conduct the seventh field season of the Tra Great Temple project. On the one of the first tasks, was to take samples of the monolith to identify the rock, pigments, and possible traces of blood fluids. Many of these uh, analyses were undertaken here in, well, near here in, at the Getty Institute. When we then conducted a geophysical study of the entire area, thanks to the combined use of ground penetrating radar, a resistivity meter and a profiler, we were able to detect a number of anomalies in the subsoil. Based on our studies, we realized that there were several cavities in this area. On the basis of geophysical data, we concluded that a huge stone box lied below the Tlaltecutli monolith. This could be a tomb or more probably a dedicatory offering buried there for consecrating the sculpture of the earth goddess. The next task was to formulate a detailed record of the monolith in its original position using a variety of techniques with our Japanese friend Saburo Sugiyama of Aichi Prefectural University. We carried out topographical mapping of the area with a brand new total station. We also did a 3D terrestrial scan with our colleagues from the Italian University of Ferrara using a Leica scanner. We measured more than uh, 30 million points, generating images of the utmost precision, like this one. Once we finished recording all the aspects of the monolith, original location, we moved the four fragments of the sculptures in November 207 using a lorm arm crane to raise each one of the pieces to street level. We then moved them to a field lab next to the fine spot to begin conservation work, incl including cleaning and restoration. You can see here our temporary field lab. The monolith stayed there during a couple of years. Thanks to this very long conservation process, the sculpture could recover its original colors. More recently, we were able to move the four fragments once again in this occasion to the Great Temple Museum in order to exhibit them for the first time. Two cranes and a long uh, uh, platform truck were used for this purpose. This was in the context of the, of the temporary exhibition Moctezuma as the ruler, first shown at the British Museum and organized with our dear friend Colin McCoon. If you visit Mexico City, you will be able to enjoy this beautiful perspective of the restored sculpture in the very center of the Great Temple Museum. But let's come back to the dig. Since two 2008, we, were, we have meticulously excavated the air below the spot where the sculpture was found. We have proceeded slowly using the scaffoldings and several swings to avoid steep, uh, stepping on any of the archaeological remains. The fruit of this work has been the discovery of offering 126, a, a huge stone box under the Tlaltecutli monolith. Oh.
Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Many technical problems for the for the same day. So you have here the, the four fragments of the sculpture. No? And we removed them and, and we we began our excavation layer by layer. It took almost one one year, eight months, one year. And we, we detected several small uh, offering boxes. And finally, the offering 126, no? which is the, the biggest we have found until now. OK. During the dedication of the monolith, the Aztecs built this box and deposited 14,000 objects. The offering was mainly composed by enormous qu quantity of animals from the sea, the tropical rainforest, and mountain regions, as well as highly diverse artifacts crafted of flint, jade, obsidian, ceramic, wood, and resin. You can see here our chief conservator recovering a small wooden mask representing a dead individual. There were also fire god images made of salt, sawfish snouts, that we, we found several uh, sharks, for example, no, uh, 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 sacrificial knives, sand dollars, starfish, many, many starfish, mm -hmm. shark, corals, wolves, pumas, jaguars, and jars containing thousands of seeds. No seeds, for example, chia, and, and maize, and, 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 and beans, and so on. Besides this huge ritual deposit, we have discovered other 40, 48 buried offerings in the same area. In total, we have been able to recover, until now, more than 70,000 objects of all kinds. Another very interesting ritual deposit, located just in front of the, from the Tlaticutli monolith, is offering 130. It contained 31 ladle sens ladle sensors, these ceramic ritual in instruments uh, similar to a to frying pans were used by the Aztecs to burn aromatic resins. Some of them have a, a beautiful handle simulating eagle claws or beautiful oh, 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 butterfly heads. South from the Tlatecutli monolith, offering 120, was detected a, uh, was detected a medium-sized size box containing, among many things, 12 golden eagles that attest to that taxidermic preparations. It had also um, roseate spoonbills. These eagles were represented, uh, represented solely by skeletal elements from the skull, wings, feet, and tail, lacking all the bones from the central portion of the body. Numerous signs of cutting were discovered on proximal ends of wings and feet bones, and incisions on the skull to extract the brain matter. These remains show that the Aztec priests buried the entire skin and its, la its uh, feather layer. We also finished excavating around the monolith. In the process, we found a spectacular entrance to the west of the sculpture and right at the level of the plaza. It was framed by superimposed rectangular andesite blocks. In other words, this entrance had the, sh the shape of an inverted stepped pyramid. Its silhouette reminds us of the Mo, which is also stepped of Tlaltecutli, the reptilian being located at the center of the universe who devours corpses in the Bodex Borgia. We dug inside the stepped portal and detected several intact plaster seals. Deposited between these plaster barriers, there were six superimposed and very rich offerings. In this National Geographic reconstruction, you can see, for example, the location of one of them, offering 125. This is uh, another reconstruction showing precisely offering 125 and its three vertical layers. Its uppermost layer was composed by a pelt of a spider monkey and two complete skeletons of golden eagles, one male and one female. On the one hand, the skeleton of the male eagle, it, it, this eagle had uh, uh, golden bells are around uh, its feet, mm -hmm. is distinguished by a visible deformity in the right wing. Digital x-rays indicate that this deformity was caused by a fracture. Although the fracture healed, this bird was unable to fly, which could, would have prevented it from hunting and feeding. 
Its bone ha bones, however, were robust and were the normal dimensions, which suggests that it was kept in captivity and was cared for by expert hands. In this regard, we should recall that within Moctezuma's palace, there was a kind of, of zoo, where eagles and many other birds were kept in cages. Franciscan friar Bernardino de Sagún mentioned that at this zoo, there were stewards who take care of all sorts of birds, such as eagles, roseate spoonbills, parrots, scarlet macaws, and pheasants. On the other hand, the female uh, eagle skeleton of, over, of this offering, uh, she had uh, these uh, copper bells around its feet, contained on, it, on its sternum a concentration of highly fragmentary Montezuma quail bones with green bone fracture patterns and homogeneous coloring at the edges. We believe that these bones could have been part of a pellet. In other words, the generally heterogeneous mass of undigested parts of a bird's food that is processed inside the gizzard and occasionally regurgitated in the case of this individual, the exclusive presence of quail might mean that this eagle, before being buried, had lived in captivity and was fed only quails. We continued excavating deeper and found an intermediate layer of marine animals and red snapper, as red snapper, fat puffer, clams, oyster, snails, corals, crayfish, crabs, and sea urchins. The majority of these animals were brought from the Pacific Ocean. It is interesting to mention that Aguizo conquered all the chiefdom located in the Pacific coast from Guerrero to Guatemala, marked in this map with yellow. No, I, I, I don't put this map, I'm sorry. This marine layer was covering the skeleton of, of a canine. Thanks to the DNA analysis, we know that it was um, an old female of Mexican wolf. I have to remark that the she-wolf we found was an elegant one because she was wearing turquoise mosaic earplugs from northern Mexico, a jade necklace from Guatemala, a seashell belt from the Mexican Gulf Coast, and a golden belt probably from Oaxaca. By the way, I, I received a, a few days ago this, this reconstruction of the, of the, of the wolf. No? That's what, what we think. <laughs> more, more, more or less like that. Huh? <laughs> so I would like to, to end this talk with really good news. One year ago, we finally detected so the, the Cochicalco. That is the cylindrical platform built by the Aztecs in front of the, of the great temple. Over this building, we found a huge slab made of, also of pinkish andesite. And after removing the, the huge slab, we found a subterranean corridor leading to the very center of the building. This is the, this, uh, the entrance of that corridor. And as you can see here, the, the corridor. We detected at the end of this corridor two closed entrances that could hide a couple of funerary chambers. Uh, these are those two entrances at the end, the, which are blocked. But this is, uh, this is just a hypothesis. We will have the opportunity to test in a few months. In a few months, we are going to, to, to resume our excavation, and we're going to, to demolish these, these uh, two walls in order to, to enter this uh, to probably, uh, to probably, uh, to probable um, chambers. So that's we took this these uh, pictures uh, a few months ago. Okay, thank you very much.
publications, uh, you, you can find there many, many of our works uh, in PDF format and, and free access. So if you want to, to read further about this subject, you can visit our website. Would you like to take some questions? Yes, please. <laughs> You mentioned that um, that status uh, was was kept in a room for some time, and that gave an opportunity for the colors to come out. I, I wasn't sure if I understood. Did they um, restore the original colors? Or yes. Uh, well, all the all the Aztec sculptures, as the Greek and Roman sculpture, were originally yeah. painted. Yeah. No, uh, we have a, they, 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 they used only five colors, white, black, blue, maya blue, red, and ochre. And uh, unfortunately, most of these, of these colors, when, when we find these sculptures, are, are gone. In this case, fortunately, we, we, we found it in a, in a very good state of conservation. And after two years of, of this very careful restoration process, uh, the, 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 conservator, uh, the conservation team could uh, recover and, and fix all these, all these colors. We analyzed them at, at the Getty as well. And uh, we know that, that the Aztecs used uh, as a binder for, for this uh, pigment uh, orchid, a, a, a kind of blue mm -hmm. made of, of, mm -hmm. of orchid. And uh, if, if you visit now the, the, the Great Temple Museum, you're going to see this sculpture with its original colors, and this is beautiful. Yeah. And in the case of the of the Koyoshauki stone, the circular monolith uh, representing the moon goddess, uh, as I told you, it was found in 1978. And uh, a, a day after the discovery, the president of Mexico <coughs> received the, the news. This, this, this was good news. No, a new stone is there, so he said, I'm going directly to the excavation spot. So the workers of the electricity company washed the stone. I wanted the president to see everything very clean. And when, when he arrived, he, he, he saw the sculpture very clean, but without the original colors. That's, that's sad, but what we, we learned from, from this, this terrible experience, and now Fortunately, the, the other stone, the, the, the earth goddess, Tlati Putri, concerns it has uh, its original colors. And so you talked about that your next project, you're going to look in basically the corridor around. So in terms of your grand plans, how, how much longer do you think you'll be doing excavations here? And also, what would you like to see in the next few years? If you your ideal plan? Yes. Well, we, we are. We, as, as I told you, our project began in, in 38 years. Mm -hmm. So my ideal my ideal plan is to to continue working for 38 more years. <laughs> <laughs> but that's ideal. <laughs> well, we we have a, a a small team. When I arrived to the Great Temple project in 1980, I was uh, 16 years old in that year. Uh, we were uh, 650 people digging in the same spot. Mm -hmm. my, my big boss was Professor Eduardo Matos, and uh, well, we, we, we were a lot. And right now we, we have very small teams. For example, my team is, is only composed by, by 20 persons. And there are, there are small teams working here and there under the National Palace, the, the cathedral, all these hotels, and in the middle of the street, wherever we can, we can dig, we are there. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have this permanent uh, program of excavation, and uh, I, I assume that uh, we will never stop. In, uh, in a few months, uh, well, uh, right now, they are working, they are building a new entrance to the archaeological zone, a new, a big hole. So, uh, by reasons of, of uh, of security, we can't dig in the Koshikalpo area, but uh, the opening is programmed for. In, in, I, I think in, in two or, or, or three months they are going to open this new entrance. Mm -hmm. So we will resume the excavation, and the first thing we are going to do is to to 
enter once again to this corridor and to unblock the, the entrances in order to prove uh, if we are right. Our hypothesis is that we will, we will, uh, we were expecting to, to find a couple of small chambers, not very big because the Aztecs didn't build uh, big, big chambers as the Maya did. So to maybe two small chambers and inside uh, maybe a big offerings, but in the very center, uh, that's what, which, which was thinking. <laughs> uh, in the very center maybe urns containing ashes. Yeah. Also, so we, what we are expecting to find are ashes of these three brothers, Ashayakatis uh, of Yawiso. Not the remains of Moctezuma because Moctezuma died during the, the conquest mm -hmm. and his body, well we don't know where, where they, they buried his, 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 his body. But uh, certainly he, he is not there. Yeah. But this is, this is just a, a hypothesis, uh, and our information, as as you heard, is, is from the comes from the from the written sources, not the the, 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 the it's historical documents uh, composed in the in the 16th century by Spaniards and by by the Aztecs themselves. Uh, given that you're digging in an urban area, and besides the permits, what has been the reaction of the communities in the areas that you've excavated? <coughs> well, the, the reaction is, well, yeah, we are in the, in the, how do you say, the spotlight. Well, we are <laughs> in the very center of the capital, and uh, all the media are there. No, that's, that's a nightmare. You, you don't want to be there. No? And, and the, the people, uh, the Mexicans are expecting always uh, good news because it's part of uh, also of, 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 you know archaeology has a, a political dimension and a dimension, a dimension of, of uh, identity of, of, so if, if, we've, if we have found that our, our identity in the glorious past where they are expecting good news mm -hmm. so they are we have many many people visiting our museums of archaeology and the, the Mexican government government has always invested big money in this kind of projects because this contributes to the to the national pride, you know. Mm -hmm. It's part of, of politics as well. Mm -hmm. What's so fantastic about this monument, um, and Montezuma Matos uh, had that great publication about it, is this combination of architecture, topography, and sculpture in, 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 a, in, a, in a single iconographic thought, you know, we to the Pocti on top of the mountain, yes, Toyo Salke thrown to the bottom just as it is in the mid. And uh, I just think it's absolutely <coughs> fantastic. Has your, has your understanding of the iconography changed at all over these years that you've been working there? Or, it, or, or has it just been reinforced? Well, Matos' uh, hypotheses are, are, are being uh, always uh, um, reinforced, as you said. For example, uh, two weeks ago, we dug at the foot of the pyramid uh, inside the platform of the of phase uh, six. And we, have, we found a, a very small offering, really interesting, because it had uh, not many objects, but most of them made of, of gold. And some of them representing all the insignia, for example, the air plugs and the nose plug of Toyo Shauke. <coughs> and uh, we, we found uh, representations of Toyo Shauke's weapons and representations of human hearts, but all of them were, were destroyed, intentionally <coughs> destroyed by the press. So we, we think this is reinforcing the, the Eduardo's. Uh, Ideas, because you, you know, at the at the summit of the pyramid is the the, the shrine of, of the solar god Huitzilopochtli, who defeated you know, his his sister and Koyoshauki is at the at the foot of the pyramid, totally defeated. She she she's dead, and uh, and uh, this 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 uh, this is remembering this offering is remembering that myth. And the, the scenarios of this of this myth is precisely the the pyramid, which is representing all these mythical plays of the of the hill of serpents. So 
this is really incredible. And this is thanks, well, all the people who, who work there uh, have the, all these codices and the, and the readers, written sources. And this is, this is really, really useful for, for our interpretations. When I work with, for example, with my friend Saburo Subiyama in Teotihuacan, this is, this, is, this is before in time. We are in, 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 the, in, the, in the classic period, and we don't have written sources. They, they had a, a very simple writing system. So we, we, we understand just the, the, the half of what, of, of what we, 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 we find because we don't have these written sources. So it, it's a, a paradise to work in the post-classic period. <laughs> but you have all these kind, different kinds of information and, and you, can, you, know, you can construct a whole model of, of interpretation thanks to, this, to, to these different sources of, of data. several teams working in Mexico City and I work there in, the, in, in downtown New Mexico City so I have in charge I, I'm in charge of this excavation of the sacred precinct but there are other teams which are working in the in the in all in different parts of the city and they're in the rural areas and there there, there are also these these uh, these offerings but, but these offerings are totally different because these are part of popular cults. And this we have here the, the representation in, in the sacred present of the Nostitan of the state religion. It's completely different. These are very, very rich deposits, very complex, and most of them are related to, most of the offerings are, are uh, cosmographs. They, that means they are uh, uh, representations in miniature of the, of the world, of the universe. So for example, the, the, the priest was Put on the in the in the deepest most uh, uh, layer, marine sand and uh, seashells and corals and so on, uh, fish, uh, starfish, whatever, representing this uh, this uh, um, how do you say how can I say that this the, the the underworld related to the fertility and to, to women, and then immediately in, the, in a, in a Middle layer, they put, uh, for example, crocodiles or turtles or jaguars, that means the animals related to the surface of the earth. And in the uppermost levels, they deposited, for example, eagles, human birds, herons, all the animal, animals related to the to the manly world, to the to the heavens. Mm -hmm. And when, when we dig, for example, in the rural areas, the the the, the offerings are related to the to the agri to agriculture. For example, we have many representations of uh, the, the maize goddess Chikomekoa, or uh, are many many uh, uh, rain god jars. But, uh, that, that means the main instrument to, for making rain. So that's what, what we find more humble offerings, but really really interesting as well. These these offerings. Uh, that are where we're in the, in the rural, rural area. So we can compare you know, these two different, very <coughs> different cults, the state cult and the popular cult. Uh, maybe one more question? Sure. Okay. Okay. Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you Do 
Yeah, as well. Uh, could you listen next to Syria again? You after the, the talk, my my email. I won't be there because I'm going directly to, to Rome, but uh, to, to to have Rome. Not Rome, Italy. But I'll give you my email. I, I, I have several students, so they, they can show you the, our excavation, our lab. Is really mm -hmm. Thank you, Sam. One, one, one more dollar, actually. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and the other question, yes, uh, obviously the, we have, oh, it's, it's a, a, in a scientific level, it's a big, big uh, burden to excavate this very rich context because you know that's archaeology you can dig only only once no? only one time each one of these deposits so we have to do it very very carefully for example the biggest uh, the excavation of the biggest offering took us more than two years because we have to record everything and when you know what, what archaeology is but in 1900 when he dug all these offerings in, along the drainage system he, well, he, he, he used to excavate what offering, one offering in half an hour. <laughs> but that was normal in those years. And in the future, they, they're going to, to excavate an offering in maybe in 10 years. <laughs> Who knows? No? So we have to do it very, very carefully. And, uh, and always, they, we have, uh, for example, with, with me, I have a, a team of, of uh, native Zapotec digging there. And sometimes they, they, they put flowers, or they, 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 they want to burn uh, copari, you know, that means uh, this, this incense not made with, with resin. And there are many mestizo and these new age cults around the, the area. And many people uh, go there, and for example, in very important days, in order to perform uh, rituals around these, but these are new religions. They, they, most of these people, they are not native Mexicans, but they are, they are mestizos as, as I am, and they are not renewing these, these, these cults. It's a, a, a very interesting mi mixture no, in, anthrop in an anthropology, anthropological level, and they are doing all these, these, uh, these rituals are uh, related to our excavation. And some of them are mad, at us because we are excavating and desecrating this space. That's, uh, that's a, a very important phenomenon. And then it happens everywhere. Not here in the States, I suppose it happens the, the same when, when you work, you work you know, in archaeological science. There are native uh, not populations who are very interested, but some, sometimes they are not very happy not to see you there, not even their, being their, their origins and their cultures. It's a quite difficult. Actually, my, my project in relation to Greg Kreisler's architecture in Mexico City, somewhere, um, it's Templo Mayor, uh, the site that I chose, and um, I was just going to ask you, like, if, I don't know, whenever you see these things come up, like, or you find something like this a huge, beautiful slab, like, do you ever feel, like, emotional, or, like, what do you, what is your, like, in, like bodily, like, reaction? <laughs> Sometimes I I cry, I, you know, big tears. You know. It has an emotional dimension. You know, it happens always with every kind of work. But this this is really really interesting. You know, we are also a scientific team working there, but we have also emotions. And you know, it, it is really really exciting. You know, the, you know these these emotions they happens during three seconds and after that we, we have to work many many days and hard work you know but it's 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 a that beautiful work huh? it's that's a killer you know? you are a killer. not most of you I suppose so it's a, it's a, it's a nice you know nice way to go down. not very well paid <laughs>
who want to, to come tomorrow at the Dijon, no? the Dijon uh, Museum, San Francisco, the, 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 the top would be... Uh, uh, doors will open at 6. Um, the title is uh, uh, Manage in Motion, because I'm inspired by Professor Rosemary Joyce, a new book on, on uh, itineraries. <laughs> and I, I will talk about the, the, the monuments, but not from Tenochtitlan, but from Teotihuacan, and how how these monuments, these big sculptures, have have been perceived over the, the years from the pre-Hispanic times to to, to to today. I put some flyers for that talk in the atrium where we are now having the reception. So perhaps we can adjourn to a drink. Yeah.